welcome everyone to today's um, honors information evening or afternoon. We will record this session and put it on YouTube for those that cannot attend today. We will edit it so that all the names or faces of you, if you turn on your camera, are not shown except um, for those presenting, just to let you know. But nonetheless, we will record it. If you in the Q&A session want to ask questions, you can do that either directly, put it in the chat to everyone, and we will try to answer that question. Or you can just um, message that Carlo directly, and he will read out the question on your behalf um, if you prefer to um, have the question asked anonymously. And that is perfectly fine. And I strongly encourage all of you to ask as many questions as you have. We have that open-ended to be and try really to answer all your questions about um, honors and the admission process and so on. With those formalities out of the way, um, yes, welcome here. Great that you came to find out about honors at John Curtin. I'm Ansan Enders, the convener and um, for the honors program and joined by the members of the honors committee which are representing the four departments and they will um, introduce themselves a bit later to you. We're also joined by Professor Liz Gardner, Deputy Director of the John Curtin School, who will say a few words to um, uh, you about the John Curtin and um, what you might expect. And then we will also hear first a bit from me about um, what honors at John Curtin involves how you, um, what do you need to do to um, apply for honors and what you can expect if you do honors next year here. We also then will hear a bit from um, Katrina, um, a honor student who recently finished and um, she can tell you about her experience in the honors year. And then, as I mentioned, we have the presentations from the departmental representatives um, giving you very, very high level overview of what research is going on in John Curtin at the moment. And um, then we come to um, the um, Q&A session where really any questions you might have about honors, we try to answer. And with this, I want to hand over to Liz. Welcome, Liz. Thanks for joining us. Uh, thank you, Anselm. Um, first of all, I'd like to acknowledge we're meeting on the land of the Ngunnawal people and uh, we pay our respects to elders present and emerging. Um, great choice, everyone. You're investigating honours, that's a, a fantastic way to finish off um, your Bachelor of Science, your Bachelor of Medical Science or um, whichever degree you're involved in. Um, anyone that's listened to me lecture in the last uh, couple of weeks or, or earlier on, you will know that I'm a very strong advocate for the honours year because it's for, if nothing else, it's your chance to join a team to be part of a small group living in a larger department or division um, where you can really begin to understand research. Uh, you also will belong, you'll be part of um, you know, lab meetings, uh, you'll be integrated into a group, you'll have somewhere to put your bag, you'll have a desk, somewhere that you can actually come to every day. This is a different world from um, walking from lecture theatre to lecture theatre or you know, walking over to libraries. Um, so I loved my honours year uh, and I can congratulate everyone for at least um, entertaining the idea of finishing your degree by doing a year in research. Um, a small word of caution, it's not a year long. It's only got, it only runs about eight or nine months. So it's actually jam packed and very intense, but um, a terrific way to get a window onto um, a true research lab. And so you're gonna to hear tonight from a whole um, host of uh, laboratory heads from across um, all our divisions at the John Curtin School and um, you know, you'll get a flavor from students of what it's like, um, you know, the good, the bad, and the indifferent. But it, look, it's a collegial year. It's, um, it's a fun year. I loved my honors year and I can still remember it. And um, I'm still doing research to this day, 
based off, um, you know, just having a great time and a great exposure all those years ago when I did on it. So um, I encourage everyone to explore, um, have a look at the uh, projects, pick a project that really, you know, inspires you, interests you. Um, and, um, you know, often there's gems of projects there that may not seem exactly what you want, but, um, you know, you make it your own and um, you'll, you'll find wherever you go in the school, there's a team there right behind you. You're not just thrown off on your own. You are part of a group that might include another honor student, a PhD student, um, postdocs, uh, other professional staff members. So, um, yeah. Enjoy this evening. I'm sorry we miss out on the pizza, but um, you know we'll we'll do our best to put to really showcase what's available at John Curtin. So I'll hand back to Anson because he'll know who the next person is. Thanks, Liz, and I take over a bit. Okay. Um, really saying a bit a repeat of what Liz already said and first of all yes we wanted to hold an in-person event that's why we initially postponed it because we were hoping lockdown would be lifted by now so that we um, had the chance to be in person in the John Curtin school where you could meet a lot of possible supervisors and directly talk to them or current students unfortunately that is not possible so I come to that later how you can um, find a supervisor. Honours, as Liz mentioned, is an honours year, or rather it's two terms of 24 units each. And they normally have to be taken in consecutive terms. But really, it's not a year, as Liz mentioned, it's starting in early February and you're done um, at the end of October, roughly. This gives really nine months to devote most of your time to a research project as part of a larger research group. And the aim of honors is really to discover something novel and to report this then through a thesis and um, seminars in the school. And maybe also um, as part of a publication or depending how um, COVID restrictions in Australia go, even at a small conference. And really the aim of honors is twofold. One, of course, that you discover something novel do research and by through that discover something novel. But it, at the same time, it really is about teaching you how to do research, how to do science. And at the end, you will be examined based on your thesis and that you demonstrate how to do science. And while honors in one way or the other is a science um, project and prepares you directly for a career in science, so a PhD and further on. And always your supervisors will hope that you really fall in love with science like we all did or um, that are here from the John Curtin School and stay in science and stay with your supervisors as part of a PhD. We know that is not always the case. Some of you will do, go on to do medicine, others will do something completely different, be it in camera, staying in camera in the public service or move to wherever you want to do because you realize science is not for you and that is perfectly fine that is a really valid outcome as well of the honors here of course we all hope you love science and enjoy it and stay with it but not everyone does and that is fine and because of that while honors is focused about research we try to teach you a lot of other skills that are broadly more transferable so, for example, you have to write a short project proposal about your research at the beginning of the honors year. And your thesis will not only be read by someone in your area of research, it will be read by a non-expert. So, for example, if you do honors in my lab in immunology, it will be read by someone in neuroscience or in cancer. And that really forces you and, and um, to write in a way that is broadly understandable and really teaches your communication skills. You also have to give two seminars, one at the beginning of your honors year about your research proposal, and then right at the end as the last activity you do, um, where you show what you actually have found out to teach. And again, it's about communication. 
more than anything else. And you also learn um, as part of the assessment of journal, um, you have to give a journal club and you may not know what it is. It means you get assigned a recently published paper from the literature and you then have to critically evaluate this, analyze the paper. Have they actually discovered what they claim to have discovered? What could they have done better and present that to the department? And again, this is really, while well, it is focused around science, obviously, because it's honors in medical science, it gives you really an essential skill for whatever you're doing afterwards. And beside that, you also will learn quite a broad range of technical skills, be it handling animals, experimental animals, um, handling genetically modified organisms, dealing with dangerous chemicals, and so on. And really, to re reiterate again something that Liz already mentioned, honors is not like any of your undergrad courses. It, in those, you will have learned from your lecturers and from the conveners and followed up with um, textbook study to learn what is already known, to give you a good start and background to whatever you now do in honors. But there, it was a defined part of knowledge that you could, you know exactly what you're supposed to know. This is very different in honors. In honors, you aim is to find out something new, something that nobody else knows in the world, where you are the first one. And this is really something very, very different. This experience being at the bench, doing science, doing the experiment, and then analyzing the data is really something very special and very um, exciting, hopefully. Um, we all love it. I love it. That's why I'm here. And um, hopefully everyone um, in, your group, in your group who decides to stay on with honors will love it as well. And it's important to understand honors is not like a normal job as well. Yes, it is a full-time commitment. And that is important to understand. It really is a full-time commitment. But it's not like a normal nine-to-five job. Science doesn't adhere normally to fixed hours. And sometimes experiments just need a long time in one go or strange time points every four or five hours. And this can be very hard. It is very demanding in the workload. And it can also often be very frustrating because experiments may not work as planned or um, the results are not as easy to interpret as you hoped. And all this can create some stress, and I don't want to really sugarcoat this. On the other hand, we hope it really is exciting stress and really motivates you to do your best. And in all what you're doing, you will be supported by your team because you're not alone. You join research group, and this group will look out for you, your supervisor, the um, students, postdocs, technicians in the lab, your fellow honor students, they all will look out for you and will help you to get through this. And hopefully you will enjoy the science, the fun of science, the incredible rewarding feeling when you discover something. And I think this is really what we try to instill in you, this fun of doing science. And um, that's where we come to. And in that sense, honors is in, of course the end of your undergraduate studies but it is also hopefully the start of a lifetime of work in science and um, in a field that you will get really excited about. Um, but as I mentioned before, we all realize that the pathways that follow from honors are different for each of you. And we will try to prepare you as broadly as possible for those. And with this, I really now stop and want to hand over for Katrina to give you a bit of her impression um, how she experienced honors and then um, the, all the departmental reps will present their department and give you a really high level overview um, of the kind of research you could be doing and afterwards I will go through some more of the technical stuff um, how to apply and what you need to consider there. Okay, Katrina. Hi, everyone. Um, so my name is Kat, and I 
as said earlier, I've recently completed my honours in the middle of this year. And my supervisor was Dr. Nikolai Shirakik, and my project looked at elements of gene expression control in age cells. Um, and I was under the umbrella of the genome sciences division. And I really enjoyed my honours year. It was a really, really fun experience. And it was truly an opportunity to get fully immersed into the world of research. You're very much thrown into a whole new environment that's totally different to um, undergraduate study. And one of the best things that I found about it was that I got to work very independently and I had um, a higher level of responsibility, I guess, than I was typically used to. And I found that with my supervisor, there was a really good balance between um, having direction from him and then I would go off and sort of conduct the experiments on my own and I would come to him with questions. Um, so it was a really good opportunity to get to do things on my own and to do things independently. And the other fun thing that I found about it is at the end, you end up with your thesis and it's sort of this finished pro product that's kind of like a documentation of everything that you achieved over the year. And that's something that's really special to have and you can get it bound and stuff and show it off that um, you really achieved a lot in just nine months. Um, and it's your data. It's something that you've generated and you've contributed to the field of science. So that's something that's very special. And another great thing about it is that you get to interact with such awesome teams of people, not just your lab, but other labs in your department, different group leaders. That was a lot of fun. Um, but like with any good thing, it's not without its challenges. So in particular for me, I found at the start, it was a little bit difficult to adjust to being so self-directed. So there was the positive of having, being able to do independent work. But at the start, it was a little bit of an adjustment because you're sort of used to having um, undergrad classes that are very structured and things like that. So it was very different getting to um, plan for myself, you know, when I was going to do an experiment, when I was going to work on my thesis, when I was going to work on preparing other stuff like talks that I had to do. But I found that once you find a schedule that works for you, that issue sort of solves itself and it becomes um, a very small problem in the grand scheme of things. And um, another thing that's difficult about it that's been said a couple of times is that uh, unlike the labs we do in undergraduate labs, the results are very unexpected. And there were times where, you know, I would do the exact same experiment that I'd done multiple times before and I would get completely different data to what I'd gotten. And it's hard because often there's not a clear cut explanation for that. You know, it could be that a reagent was out of date or that, you know, something had, like your pipettes hadn't calibrated properly and you put the wrong amount of something in. So it was very um, frustrating at times to kind of have things not go as they were expected to go. But this was also, an exciting point as well because it means that you get to really explore and you get to sort of troubleshoot with your supervisor and work things out and um, so that ends up being a positive as well because you get to learn a lot and um, I learned a lot during honours outside of you know written and verbal communication skills I learned how to plan very rigorously and how to work with and around other people's schedules even small things like um, only having limited numbers of a certain device in the lab, you've got to talk to your lab members and see when you can use the equipment for the amount of time that you need. Um, so that was something that was I wasn't used to doing. And in terms of advice that I can kind of give to you know, prospective students, I would say it's, it's good that you're here to kind of learn more about the program. And it's also good to start looking into projects fairly early and try and talk to a lot of different researchers and sort of get a feel for what's out there. And um, try to, I guess when you're deciding on your project, try to pick a balance of clicking with the person who's behind the project. So having a good relationship with your supervisor, but also being passionate about the project that you have and be open-minded about the project descriptions. There's a lot of like wiggle room and there's a lot of stuff that you can do in your project. So just find something that 
you're somewhat passionate about, you're somewhat interested in, and a person that you click with, and just kind of run with those two things. And that's the best way of going about it. And um, as it's been stated before, another thing to remember is that there's lots and lots of support available for you. So you've got your formal layers of support, like your supervisor, your advisor, and your course convener. But there's so many other people, like PhD students, postdocs, PhD students, not just in your lab, but throughout the department, past on the students, current or on the students. And it's very important to remember that even though it's a hard year, everyone's working for you and not against you, and everybody really wants you to succeed and do well. So that's kind of the main things that I would say to everybody looking at doing honours. Um, I'll hand back. Thank you. Um, very good. Um, I think to hear from your experience and all very, very good points. You've um, already covered half of what I was about to say afterwards. Um, thank you for making my life easier. Um, Tanya, do you want to start with um, the presenting the um, genome division? Yes, yes, I was just going to start sharing my screen just to show you one and the only slide that I have. Can you see my screen? Yes. Yes. Okay. Thank you. So I'll just put it all on, on it. So, yes, yeah, so just like uh, Katrina just mentioned, she did her honors in the uh, Department of uh, Genome Biology. Uh, we are now merging with the cancer department, but when you do your searches for possible projects, uh, we still on the website have our genome biology department as a separate uh, entity. So um, as you can see from the name, um, uh, we are interested in anything to do with the uh, ways how our genome is controlled and how it is utilized by the um, cell and uh, if you can see my mouse, can you see the mouse or not? We can see it. Ah uh, yes, thank you. So uh, in our department we have quite a number of mo 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 model organisms and model cells that we are using. Uh, for example, here we have a Drosophila, uh, we have uh, yeast uh, as a model, we have mammalian cells and cancer cells and even uh, sperm, uh, sperm cells as a model for my study in genome and uh, cell differentiation. So if I start from the bottom of the slide, uh, one of the things that we're quite interested in is epigenetic research. Uh, we're looking at how the genome or chromatin uh, structure and function is controlled by various genetic mechanisms. For example, my group is very interested in uh, one type of epigenetic um, uh, factors called histone variants, how they uh, uh, control transcription and splicing. Uh, uh, David Tremethic here is interested in uh, uh, three-dimensional architecture of genome. We both uh, use um, spermatogenesis as the model. So we work a lot with mice and we're looking at how those histone variants control differentiation of uh, sperm uh, cells and how these testis-specific uh, histones, uh, when they become abruptly or apparently expressed in cancer, how they control uh, cancer progression. Um, so Tamash Fischer here on the picture, he also is studying uh, various epigenetic mechanisms, but his uh, focus is on non-coding RNAs and he's looking at uh, their function and how they affect structure of genome and he's using uh, yeast cells and mammalian cells as his model um, or, or organisms and he's looking at things like genome stability, DNA repair, uh, RNA DNA interactions. So if we're moving further, the genome obviously needs to be transcribed into RNA uh, in order for, uh, for that to function. So here we have an RNA biology hub represented by Nikolai, uh, Katrina's uh, supervisor, uh, by Rick Kay and by Thomas. So uh, 
uh, Nikolai here, he's looking at, or Katrina was also working on how mRNA is translated and uh, how the protein synthesis is controlled, for example, during stress and in cancer in comparison to normal uh, conditions or during aging, for example, in comparison to normal conditions. Uh, Thomas Price, who is currently uh, our co-head of the genome biology department, looking also at RNA, but he's quite focused on post-transcriptional uh, post RNA modifications and how these modifications affect RNA translation. So um, RNA modifications are quite a hot field at the moment. And also uh, Repai here, he uh, is interested in uh, how uh, transposable elements that are kind of uh, uh, viral uh, DNA that is incorporated into our uh, genome uh, throughout evolution is silenced by a particular class of non-coding RNAs called pi RNA. And uh, also uh, part of our department is the hub of bioinformaticians uh, who are also quite interested in RNA biology. So here we have Eduardo uh, who is uh, developing new computational methods and he's quite interested in alternative RNA splicing in long read sequencing technologies. So this is the lab that actually is uh, doing actual programming and coming up with new uh, tools to, um, uh, uh, to analyze uh, genome and um, RNA. And uh, least, uh, last but not least is Jean. Uh, so she is also a very talented bioinformatician who is interested in a single cell um, uh, sequencing and advanced machine learning. So if there are students amongst you who are interested in uh, bioinformatics, um, developing their bioinformatics skills, these two uh, groups are definitely the ones to consider. Uh, well, in fact, I must say that we all have to use uh, pipeline you know, bioinformatic technologies in order to analyze our data. Um, uh, and, uh, you know, uh, it's great if you can, can get experience of the wet lab and bioinformatic side of that, like what Katrina has experienced during her honors project, which I think was really cool for honors. Uh, so, yeah, so a lot of uh, uh, wet lab application happens within those uh, six groups, uh, which are here in the epigenetic protein structure function hub and RNA biology hub. So I guess that's um, just a very broad overview, but you can go to the John Gurdon School webpage. If you go into the uh, research, uh, 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 research tab, you can find our department and you can find all our different uh, groups and a description of what we do and potential projects. They're all listed there. Thank you, Anselm. I'm finished. I'll just stop sharing. Thank you, Tanya. Um, next one, Ian, would you mind presenting the um, immunology? Sure, um, I can do that. Um, so let's get this going. Um, okay, so um, Immunology is housed within what is now called the division. I think it's called the division of immunity, infection and inflammation. I might have my eyes in the wrong order there. But as, um, as Tanya alluded to, if you, um, if you actually want to find us on the website, you'll have to look for our old name, which is the Department of Immunology and Infectious Disease. But it is more or less the same, the same um, group of, um, of um, the usual suspects. We'll find the same people there. So who are these people? So as you can sort of imagine from our, from our division name, um, we work across several different areas. So immunity, well, actually mainly autoimmunity and immunodeficiency. We have a large number of groups there. So Anselm, Matthew, um, Anna, Dan, Chris Nolan. Carola has left, but, um, um, but her, her group lives on. And so Julia Eliard, I think would be a good point of contact there. We have a few of us who work predominantly within infection. So myself, David Sharkey, Brendan Morin. But what I would point out is, is that particularly myself and David, we really are um, fairly sort of basic immunologists. We just work with infection models. So for example, though I work on malaria, um, I'm not really working on parasite biology. I'm working on that host immune response to the parasite. So, so very much a, a fundamental immunologist as well. 
And then we have people like um, Seeming, Rachel Lee, who work predominantly in areas of inflammation, covering those three eyes. So, so this is um, um, so just to put some some faces to those names. So, um, Gaetan Bergio works on multi-drug resistant bacteria and CRISPR. Sorry. So these are more the kind of the um, the infection um, and inflammation people. Um, Brenda McMorrin, like me, is another malaria researcher. Um, Seeming Man works on inflammation, sepsis, and to some extent on drug resistance. Um, me, looking cheerful there because they've let me out of my office, that's why I'm wearing a lab coat. Um, I work on malaria, but both on T and B cell responses, so very much the adaptive immune response, whereas someone like Seeming and, and Brendan would work more on the innate immune response. Um, Rachel Lee um, doesn't quite fit in in this group, but um, working on arthritis and osteoimmunology. Um, she's based partly at the Canberra Hospital, and in a moment I'll say that there's a few people who work between the Canberra Hospital and the John Curtin. And then our head of division, um, David Sharkey, who works on um, viruses, CD8 T cells, antigen presentation. Um, but again, very much, well, I mean, again, he very much straddles that, um, that um, world of microbiology, but also fundamental immunology as well. And then um, next we have the, the, the more sort of the more autoimmunity and primary immunodeficiency groups. So I put Julia there working on um, lupus, autoimmunity and B cells. Um, Dan Andrews is a computational, and the L has got lost there, computational immunology and bioinformatics. So very little, so no real wet lab stuff with him, more um, fundamental, more sort of um, analyzing data in novel and different ways. Um, Chris Nolan, as you can tell, he's wearing a jacket. That means he's probably a physician. Um, so he works on diabetes and autoimmunity. Um, you won't actually find him on the um, John Curtin webpage. You'll have to look up on the medical school webpage, but he is part of our division and is, uh, has a co-appointment co there. Um, Anselm, who of course you will all now be familiar with, working on immunodeficiency in B cells. Uh, Matt Cook, another person predominantly based at the Canberra Hospital. Um, so if you're working at the hospital, you can sometimes be a, um, a little bit separate from the life of the division. So you have to sort of work to, um, but, but there's fantastic projects down there, very patient facing kind of work. And then Anna Brussel working on largely on, on, on um, autoimmunity, but on MS and T cell differentiation. And so I think I will hand over to the next person since time is short. Thank you, Ian. And as the next one, um, Essan, would you mind saying a few words about the um, neuroscience? Uh, sure. I, um, I apologize. I don't um, have my camera doesn't work, but hopefully you can see my slides, which is the important part. So I can talk through these. Is that Thanks. visible now? Yeah. Okay. Yes. So, um, the Division of Neuroscience, we call ourselves the Echoes Institute of neuroscience and uh, as many of you know it's um, called the Echoes Institute um, because of the Sir John Echoes who um, was awarded the Nobel Prize in 1963 um, the Nobel Prize in Physiology and Medicine along with, with Hodgkin um, uh, and Huxley and uh, this was for the discoveries of basic ionic mechanisms that underlie excitation and inhibition in neurons. And this tradition of um, asking fundamental questions in neuroscience still lives on in the department. Um, as many of you know, the brain is a very complex organ. In fact, it's composed of um, 100, about 100 billion neurons, uh, about the same number as the number of stars in the Milky Way and um, a lot more connections. So we have something of the order of 10 quadrillion or 10 to the power of 15 synapses in every single one of us in their brain. And these neurons are responsible for uh, processing our environment, for us to be able to see, to smell, to touch, and to taste and hear things, and to act, to move ourselves around, to have emotions, ideas, thoughts, and dreams. And even though these are fundamental properties of human existence, 
it's interesting that a lot of these, the neural mechanisms underlying a lot of these functions are not fully understood. So the research um, in the neuroscience department has this basic brain function flavor to it, but related to that, we take, once you have certain understanding brain functions, you also relate them to certain disease conditions. Um, so, so there's some, some work on fundamental um, functionings of the neurons in the brain and some work on the brain related diseases that undergo in the department. And we approach overall the, the whole department, if you think in uh, approaches the question of uh, neuroscience at many different levels. We have projects that deal with individual proteins, ion channels, um, to single neurons, um, small networks of neurons, uh, big systems in the brain, and all the way to behavior. And the idea is to try to understand uh, the, the function of our brain at multiple levels, to have a full mechanistic understanding of the, the phenomena that I just described to you. Um, I won't be able to talk about individual groups in the department. Uh, many of you would be familiar with the research in the department through the two undergraduate courses that we teach in neuroscience, the cellular neuroscience course, the first semester course, and the sensory and systems neuroscience course that many of you who are interested in doing neuroscience are probably undertaking right now. Um, so I just give you a, a brief overview of the the sort of various experimental um, things that happen in the department. So we um, look at activity of nerve cells through either electrophysiology or optical imaging. And we do all of these things um, at multiple levels from brain slices where individual neurons are, are isolated or small networks of neurons, all the way to the whole brain under anesthesia in various animal models, particularly rodents are very popular, um, all the way to recordings of neuronal activity or imaging of neuronal activity in awake behaving animals um, that are making decisions or processing their sensory environment. Now, uh, as I said, I won't go into the details of uh, individual groups, um, you can find that if you go onto the John Curtin website and the Echoes Institute of Neuroscience and look on the research. But generally speaking, there is a flavor of addressing sensory processing across a number of labs. Again, we approach the questions of olfaction, touch, vision in different labs, but uh, at multiple levels from uh, synaptic transmissions and individual ion channels all the way to uh, circuits and behavior. There, are, there is a group um, interested in neuronal development, and there are a number of groups that work on human retina and, and its associated diseases. Um, so I encourage you to go onto the website and read about individual groups. I won't describe them individually. Thank you, Ansem. That's all from me. Thank you, Essam. And, um, as the last presenter, um, so we have still two representatives for the um, department, what is now genome science and cancer. It used to be two um, departments, it's now one division. Barry Thompson is the um, other um, presenter, and um, but I think he couldn't join us today. So instead, um, Liz Gardner, the deputy director of the John Curtin School, and until I think last month, um, director of the um, cancer department, as it was then, will present briefly an overview of the research that is going on in that division. Thanks, Anton. Can you see my screen? Yes. Uh, yeah. Thank you. Perfect. Okay. Uh, yeah. Thank you. So it's my pleasure to just uh, make a few introductory comments about uh, our cancer department. Uh, to, the only cancer biology department in Australia, at least when it was set up uh, six years ago, we're relatively young. Um, and uh, so with a core interest in attacking cancer from all angles. So this includes at the fundamental level, understanding uh, molecular biology and biochemistry, the cell biology, proteomic and genomic approaches to um, cancer, 
what makes um, a, a, a cell so dysregulated uh, in, in a human cancer, either in a dish or in a person. Uh, translational models, we have a host of um, projects looking at uh, treating of uh, mouse models, uh, Drosophila models, and um, uh, <clears throat> Uh, in terms of uh, understanding molecular process that are going on to trigger a cancer, so many cancer models. Often these are done actually in collaboration with other members of other departments. So Ansem is a great example. Uh, he has a collaborative research project with people in the cancer department because um, he actually knows he wants to work on cancer, not immunology. No, just kidding. He um, brings an immunology flavor um, to important questions because of course, all of these projects intersect. It's not that we study anything in isolation. And then we have um, a whole clinical component to our department where we are um, evaluating drugs in, um, in treatment of uh, cancer patients, either in the uh, preclinical phase or even in phase one clinical trials. To do that, we have a very strong collaborative link with the um, Canberra Regional Cancer Centre down at the at Canberra Hospital in Woden. And uh, where, so we have the opportunity to participate and also lead clinical trials into um, some of the drugs that were even identified by uh, members of our department in uh, earlier years. So you could have an opportunity to um, intersect with cancer at any of, of these levels and often at multiple levels. So I don't have beautiful um, pictures of all the members of our uh, department, but suffice to say, here's um, a, a set of people uh, and I encourage you to go and meet with the people individually. A lot of them, you'll know them because you've been lectured to by um, a lot of them, for example, Professor Leonie Quinn is the convener of the Hallmarks of Cancer course, which I know a number of people will be taking. I've highlighted the people in red. These are people that have clinical training as well as, um, as uh, fundamental research training. And so that's why I say we have a good mix across our department of people that can sit at all levels, um, at all different styles of project, all targeted with evaluating um, uh, loss of con control of cellular growth. And just as a quick plug, you know, many people, uh, or most people die with cancer, not of cancer. Most of the time they're dying of thrombosis and um, cardiovascular complaints associated with the cancer. And so in my group, um, and as well, uh, Chris Parrish's group, we study lots of the um, other aspects of cancer biology which affect platelet function and vascular biology function. So uh, there's a whole host um, of projects with a cancer link, but that extend more into fundamental biology. So I'll stop there and encourage everyone, you know, come onto the websites, look at the projects and then speak with, um, with the, lab, the lab heads. Thanks. Thank you, Liz. Um, and with this, it's back to me um, to give you a bit more uh, detailed view how to on the older um, administrative side before we come to the Q&A session. I briefly, be patient with me. I just want to um, quickly share the screen. So here you see the um, website of the John Curtin School. Do you? Is that showing? Yes. Good, thank you. And um, if you go to the homepage of the John Curtin School and click here on the link study, and you can select on us. And this is really the page that is relevant to you. It has a lot of information about all the um, course and the application process. It also has links to all the departments and this will bring you to the web pages that were already mentioned where you can see all the different groups get a very quick overview um, what they're doing or click in more detail for example here nikolai's group um, and can read what this group is interested in 
is, is it just me that I can only still see the John Curtin web page? Is that just me? Um, that is a problem. Oh no, here it goes. No, no, no it's moving. Yeah. Okay, sorry. Um, let's start again. Um, so on the home page, the link study on us. Not sure what happened there. I think I, I put it on my other screen that I look into the camera while speaking, but that obviously breaks Zoom somehow. Um, so Zoom can't cope with you looking at it. <laughs> obviously not. So here you see the link to the different departments. And if you um, click on one of them, you see the, all the groups listed there and can click on them again and read more what they are about to um, what their interest is and you get the email to the group leader and that is the best way to contact them have a look at these groups have a look at the web pages for whatever you are interested in and send an email most doesn't matter um, if the group leader has advertised that they're taking students or not this all changes and is usually out of date as soon as it posted to the website. So if you find someone where you think what this group is doing is interesting to you, send them an email. Most of them will be delighted to hear from you and um, will be more than happy to meet with you either um, on Zoom or if um, possible in the future um, in person to talk about possible research projects that are available in their group and um, what honors in their group would look like. There is also here a link on um, student research projects that links, um, links to a PDF file where um, all the groups are listed, but that is gives you a flavor of what is there, but don't get hung up on this project. They are probably already out of date, as I mentioned. Take it as a flavor and just if you see something that is of interest to you, go from there by contacting the group. Don't get too hung up on the um, really detailed, narrow, specific project. And I would always recommend rather go for the website um, than and the links here instead of this PDF file that is probably um, far more out of date already. The next um, here is also the application um, dates. And um, while you have until the 15th of December, I encourage you rather get organized now, contact your supervisor now, because as soon as they have um, accepted a student, they probably won't accept two. They may accept two students, but definitely not more in most circumstances. And um, places fill up in that sense. So don't wait until the last day. Having said that, if major disaster strikes and a project falls through or you discover on the 1st of January as a New Year's resolution, yes, you want to do honors this year, let us know and we can um, try to see if we can do a late enrollment. But that is always more tricky, so please don't rely on that. Then here's a link to scholarships that you can apply for. Um, just have a look at those. If you're eligible, if you click on the link, you see what is the field they are available, um, eligibility criteria, what the benefits are. They are all have different criteria because, and some are only eligible for very specific projects because they are um, funded through bequests from people with a specific interest. Um, that is, uh, the first part, then also, if you have any questions, you can either send an email to me and I will try to get back to you, or you can send an email to Linda, who is also on the call today. And through this functional email, she is the one that really um, is the key person for all the background administration work. And she will be able to give you advice on all the details for the enrollment or um, pass it on to me. But quite often, if you send it directly to me, I may go back to Linda and say, hey, what is all about here? So use this email, please, as well. And then here's the link how to apply for honors. If you have decided you want to apply for it, you click here. And that takes you to the ANU page where you see 
all the um, information again. I just want to highlight a few things. One is the eligibility criteria. And this is really that you need to um, have a weighted average mark of 70% across six of your courses in, um, that are relevant to your honors. What is relevant is a bit flexible. And um, we try to really look at your transcript and see what courses have you done in years two and three that would be relevant to honors within the group that you want to do it. And sometimes that is absolutely clear cut. In some cases, it's a bit more borderline. Is that course relevant or not? It's an internal assessment. And we try to be inclusive. We try to um, make it possible for you to attend. But of course, there are some limits. But if you are in doubt, if you meet the eligibility criteria or not, talk to your supervisor about it. There's nothing more helpful than a supervisor that is really enthusiastic about you joining the group and says, yes, this student is really great. I've spoken with him or her and I want her to join my group and I think she has all the skills. Yes, the um, courses may not be all relevant, but she has this that is really great asset for the project she's going to do. And so please just talk to your supervisor. They will be able to help you and provide a bit of extra feedback to me and the departmental representatives who will assess those criteria. Um, then the um, other thing here, how to find a supervisor. We've already discussed this. Go to... Um, the web page and have a look at the research groups, what they are doing and contact them. And the worst that can happen is that you don't get a reply or that you get a reply, ah, thanks for contacting me. Unfortunately, I already have more students than I can um, supervise, so I'm not taking anyone else on. So um, that's really the worst that can happen. So just send emails, talk to the people, because also as Katrina mentioned in her, um, talk earlier, it's not only about the project. The project is important and you should be excited about it, but at least as important is that you feel you get along well with the group and the group leader. Um, you need to be part of that environment and it is an intense. You will work very closely with the group leader and their whole group. And most of the group leaders will encourage you to not only meet with them, but also meet with some of the current honors or PhD students or postdocs so that you get a feeling what they are like and also they get a feeling how you are and what your interests are. Um, that is one um, thing here to say. Then the process for um, submitting your application, um, whatever your project is, your undergraduate, is it biotechnology, um, is it medical science, and so on. These are the relevant forms. And there is, for medical science um, or medical research, this um, supplementary form. And if you click here, this is really where you have to um, uh, state your name and you have to find a supervisor. Your supervisor has to sign here that they are happy to accept you in their group. There's also the aspect, a lot of research projects in John Curtin involve, um, involve animal research, that it has been discussed with you, that you have to do that or not, and that you're comfortable with doing that. Not everyone is, and that is perfectly fine, but this ha should be discussed before you start, sign up with a group, um, because in some groups, it's very difficult to find a project that doesn't involve animals. And if you're in doubt, talk to your potential supervisor about it, depending how restrictions go. It might be possible for you to come to the lab, have a look what it would involve in terms of animal experiments, and then make a much more informed decision if you are comfortable with doing that or not. The project title here, yes, you need to fill it in, and that will give an idea of what your project will be. But neither I nor anyone else will hold you to it. We all understand sometimes what sounds like the perfect project now may not be in four months time or six months time when you start on us. 
So there might be changes. Nonetheless, it is important that you've discussed the project um, with your supervisor so that there is a clear expectation both for you and from the supervisor what you are going to work on. And once that is done, you submit all that to Linda and um, she will collate that and at the end, um, together with your transcript, the um, departmental representatives and I will look at that and sign off on it. Also, it will um, require sign off from the head of the department to ensure that really there are the resources um, in the lab, that there's the space there that you can work. That is all normally uh, formality, nonetheless, not always. And again, that's why it is important to put the forms in as early as possible. So if there are any difficulties, that can be discussed in time. And I think with that, I'm at the end of what I wanted to talk to you. And we are coming to the Q&A um, session now. And um, I'm happy to hear questions either for me or for any of the departmental um, representatives so that we can answer whatever questions you have about finding a supervisor, doing honors, life as a student at John Curtin, and whatever else you might want to know. Hello, my name's Raya. I think my biggest concern about doing honours next year is the risk of COVID. In terms of if you were doing a wet lab honours project, um, are there any um, plans that you have in place for honor students that wouldn't be able to complete all of those wet labs? Um, I probably take that. Um, as you, I'm sure you're aware, that is not a new consideration. We've been dealing that with this last year and are dealing with it now again. Last year, most of the students, because it was when COVID really hit, was early in the year, most students deferred enrollment to the middle of the year. Yeah. And that allowed them then to um, complete honors half a year late, obviously, but it allowed them to fully complete the honors year. There were a few students that did their whole project right through, obviously with a slightly um, reduced scope. And most of them, I think, had um, the second semester as an 186 unit. So they just finished directly before Christmas, a bit later than planned, to give them more time to complete the experiments. This year, the restrictions were not as strict, at least not yet, and most of the students were able to continue with their experiments, even in the last few weeks. Not every experiment has happened, and I'm sure there will be some extensions happening, there will be some um, uh, delays or reduced scope of the project, but we will take that into account and hopefully by next year, most of us are vaccinated and there will not be as severe restrictions hopefully happening as they are at the moment. So we will, um, we hope that you can do honors reasonably normal and attend the lab and do all your experiments. But yes, it's a very good question. And I don't have a perfect crystal ball to see, um, to foresee what is going to happen. All right. Well, thank you anyways. I think, I think one thing just, I mean, like after last year, we now, we now have lots of, we now know all the options, whether it's reduced study load, deferral, extensions. Like we, we, you know, we have a variety of tools at our disposal. Yes. Um, and as Anselm says, I suspect last, sorry, next year we'll be in a more stable situation. It may not be perfect. There'll probably still be restrictions, but we'll know what they are and we'll be able to work around them. Um, so that is, um, yeah. And we take that individual. It may be very different for a more computational project where a lot of the work can be done at home um, with remote access to a computer versus a lab wet project. And that is also then one of the questions, can you provide a bit of an insight into computational projects? How are these projects structured differently to lab projects? I may hand that to Tanya in a minute, but saying that obviously you are more flexible in your time in some ways because you're not as dependent on experimental time points, but all the other formal requirements in terms of presenting um, your project, writing a proposal, 
doing the journal club and so on are the same. Tanya, do you want to add um, some? Yes, definitely. Uh, so with computational projects, um, I guess, uh, yes, if they are fully computational, there is uh, no wet lab component, for example, or there will, there is also a number of groups that uh, offer computational part and wet lab part. So, uh, for example, Nikolai Shirokin does that, uh, Thomas Price does that, Rupai Kayashi does that um, in our department. So, uh, with the computational projects, usually you will have to have interest, obviously, in uh, bioinformatics. And uh, it's good if you also had some background uh, in, uh, you know, uh, taking some courses, undergraduate courses that relate to uh, bioinformatic uh, skills. However, often uh, your supervisors will be able to teach you a lot of those things. For example, with a particular pipeline that already has been developed and published, you will be taken step by step uh, by your supervisor through it, and then maybe uh, you will introduce certain novel uh, steps to it to uh, somehow modify that. So that would be related to most of the projects. With Eduardo's project, Eduardo Yeris, um, uh, that is much more programming-based work. So that would be more interesting for people who actually want to program. Uh, maybe Katrina can uh, tell uh, about her experience because you've done that project where you had both. Uh, how did that go? How, how much background did you have before you started? How much have yeah. you done? Um, so my project, Initially with my project, I was meant to do the wet lab component and um, have somebody else do the bioinformatic processing. But the way that it ended up was that I decided that I wanted to be a little bit more involved in that process. So I actually ended up analyzing all of my own data, um, which was definitely challenging because I didn't really have any experience in coding like I'd done two programming courses in R, but like very general, and I also didn't do very well in them. So I sort of had to teach myself a lot, but there were also other bioinformaticians in the department who could help me. Um, definitely to do a computational project, someone like Eduardo is a good person to talk to because he has lots of opportunities and he's um, a very good supervisor to have. and everybody in his labs really experienced and I know that there are other labs as well um, but yeah thanks Katrina thank you so the next question is do honors student also study as normal six weeks and then two week break followed by six weeks per semester no it really is right through from the beginning early January early February late January and to until you submit your thesis in October how having said that you are entitled to take some leave. Um, normally, two weeks leave should be absolutely um, not only be possible, but I strongly encourage you to take it. Honors, as Katrina will be able to attest, attest is a very intense year, and it is important to take a break, to um, step back and recharge. And your supervisor definitely will make that possible and should make that possible, and if not, you should talk to me or the departmental representatives that we have a work with a supervisor. However, you need to um, arrange your leave with the supervisor so that the experiments can work around that. And then another question is if many honors students work at the same time. I have, as I said before, honors is a full-time commitment, so 35, 40 hours a week. However, we all know you need to earn some money. A lot of you need to do that. And your supervisor absolutely should understand that need and um, allow you to work. There is no um, way to prevent you. However, if you say, huh, you want to work two days a week from nine to five somewhere, that's probably not going to work with honors. Um, so it, you need to really talk to your supervisor what is possible or not. Again, it's very hard to give a very strict guideline because it depends on the projects. 
if it's something again computational it might be far more flexible than when it is um, a lab-based project and but even within lab-based projects there are some things that are more flexible than others but quite often it's um, there's a lot of activities there's seminars for example in the immunology department we have a departmental seminar every wednesday we have a work in progress meetings on fr mondays there's a school seminar on friday there's a journal club on friday and you're expected to attend all of these so it's very hard if you say no every friday you're out and um so it really yes we understand you have to work and and earn some money um obviously but it will require some flexibility and definitely a bit of a discussion with you and your supervisor and if you think you will have to work a lot especially during normal working hours it's probably worth discussing that with your supervisor very early on before you sign up to ensure um, that it fits with the project then there's another question um, uh, and one thing if you ask the question and feel we haven't answered it properly please just send a follow-up or speak up we try to answer it correct um, more detail then there's a question about um, COVID and that your lab skills are maybe not um, as great as they could have been I wouldn't worry about that I think you will realize very quickly that whatever you've learned in the lab prax, you learn more in one week in the lab in the in the research environment than you've done throughout your all whole under um graduate career unless you have done some extra advanced study courses and re six week research projects like some of you may have done um but otherwise i wouldn't worry about that i think your lab will be able to teach you all the required lab skills very quickly. Um, for neuroscience almost is there a minimum GPA or average mark? There is the same um, uh, for all honors degrees, which is the 70% average in six um, second and third year courses with relevance to your um, uh, project. And um, that is, um, and that's why we look at your transcript and then assign the course. As I mentioned before, we try to be inclusive and usually give you the benefit of the doubt, but it might require a bit of a discussion between you and your supervisor, or even between the departmental rep and you or and the supervisor, if it really is a questionable um, average mark. Having said that, one of the best honor students that I ever had, I think she just scraped across the line of their 70% um, average, and she ended up with the highest honors mark of her year and cohort. Undergraduate, yes, there is a correlation between undergrad marks and honors mark, but it's not enormously strong. Some students just suddenly thrive in the environment of a research-based project, and others that really did incredibly well in the undergraduate studies, realize lab work is not as much for them. So don't worry too much about it. For cancer honors, is it possible to get in contact with current cancer department honors students to get more information about the year? Um, yes, probably the easiest way if you want to do that is either through a potential supervisor, um, ask them to put you in contact, send an email to your departmental um, representative. So in this case, um, Barry uh, or Tanya, um, or contact me and we will try to put you in contact with um, current students. Or um, if um, Katrina is happy um, for her email to be passed around, or if you have her contact details, send her a message now and she might be able to um, put you in contact with um, current or past honor students. And that is true for all departments. So that is not cancer specific. But because the question is about cancer, Barry, I've seen you just joined. Do you want to say something specifically about that? And introduce yourself briefly. Hi, I'm Barry. I'm the coordinator for cancer. Uh, so yeah, I think it is definitely a good idea to talk to 
current honors students, all you need to do is email your supervisor, tell them you're interested in doing honors with them, have the first conversation. And once you've had that conversation, ask, can I talk to a previous honors student or, you know, who's in your lab um, or in your department? And, and I'm sure that they'll be willing to put you in touch uh, yeah. and have, have a conversation. I, I don't know if that answers the question. Yeah, I think it does. And what I do, I always, put potential honor students in contact with my group and make sure that they have a chance to talk to the group without me being present. Yes. So that there is clearly not the pressure for me saying, ah, you have to say something good. Otherwise you are in trouble as soon as <laughs> we're alone. Um, I think that is really important. It really is very, very important to talk to current students, be it honors, be it PhD students. What is the style of work in that lab? Um, for those, um, the next question was for those supervisors working from the Canberra hospital, are the honor students also involved in the patient facing side of the project or are they still mainly based from JCSMR? So usually an honor student would not directly interact with a patient, but you might work directly on patient samples and you might do that either at Canberra hospital. Some students are placed at least for large parts of the project at Canberra Hospital in a lab there. Some others would work um, more at John Curtin, even if the supervisor is um, partially working at the Canberra Hospital. That is different between different supervisors, depending on the specific project and so on. But um, normally, I would not expect that an honor student directly deals with the patient. Of course, if it really is very focused on one specific patient, there might be a possibility to meet that patient, but usually not. What sort of things should we include in an expression of interest email to the supervisor? Well, very, um, whatever you think might then get them interested in you. So tell them a bit about you, what you are interested in. Why are you interested in their research? Have you done already a project in the area or um, why you would, yeah, why do you want to do that? Do you have any special skills? For example, if you contact someone with a strong bioinformatics project, it probably would be helpful to mention if you have done um, two semesters um, computational computer science and are perfect in programming in R, C or Python or whatever else. The same if you have done already five um, research projects and um, are a co-author on 10 papers. Please mention that by all means. Um, it will get your interest up. But, but, but I ask, um, what to don't, put, don't put everyone off. Like, like no, people, no people, we never well, see that. Into with 10 <laughs> <laughs> I know, I mean, sorry. I could answer. <laughs> the most I mean, important was... thing is the academic record. If you could yeah. please, yes. please yeah. attach that. Yes. Absolutely. Um, on a more realistic series note, yes, attach your um, transcript. Normally, most students come in, they've done undergraduate, have the lab pranks, but no further research project. And um, that is perfectly understood by everyone. So just say, hey, you have seen the website, um, the blurb, you're interested in whatever they are researching, and you would like to know if there's an honors project in their lab. Here's the transcript, and that will normally be sufficient. If you have anything else that is really specific, do it. But um, it probably will come up more when you meet with them. And I just also mentioned that one thing that attracts me very much in students is that if they have read a little bit about your work and they reflect it in some way in the email, that actually really makes it very uh, special and you can see serious attitude of the student when they address you rather than just saying generally I'm interested to do honors. So that one thing that if you do a little bit of digging, uh, just to research a little bit about your supervisors, uh, publications and stuff, that would be really nice to see as well. Yeah. Kalo, do you have any other questions that were sent directly to you? No, not on my end. Nope. Any other questions from any student here? Um, 
Yeah, sorry, I've got a quick question. Yeah. How many supervisors do you recommend getting in contact with initially? Because it might be hard if you're emailing like five or six and everyone's interested. Um, I wouldn't limit myself too much. I mean, you probably don't want to send an email to every academic in the school, but um, five or six, I don't think is over the top. If you find five or six supervisors that you're interested in, go for it. If you only find one, contact only one. Um, as long as you have a feeling that this group does research that you're interested in, contact them. And then because after you've met with them, you will have a much better feeling if that group is right for you or not. Yeah, I think I could also comment on that. So I think when I was looking at supervisors, I I started out by making a spreadsheet and I made like a spreadsheet that had the supervisor's name, their email, their main project and any papers of theirs that I'd read. And I think I had maybe like 10 to 15, but I would contact them sort of in rounds. So I started off with the people who I was most interested in their projects and then just kind of worked my way down if they had students or things like that. So that's sort of a good way to approach it. Well, it worked for me. <laughs> You seem very organized, but yes, I think that is really um, valuable. And we all, and when I say we, I mean potential supervisors, we know you will be talking to multiple people and nobody is offended when you talk um, to the, your colleague in the lab or in the office and say, hi, oh, yeah, I just got this really great student contacting me about honors and just, yeah, I as well. What's the name? Oh yeah, it's the same. Um, it happens all the time and nobody's offended by that. We all know that's how it is. Thank you so much. Any? I also just had a quick question if that's all right. Yeah, of course. Um, I was curious about how the uh, experience differs between um, uh, entering mid-year honours versus start of year? Because I imagine most people sort of apply for honours beginning of the year. Um, I only finished my degree mid-year, so I imagine there's a smaller cohort and sort of it would go through holidays. I'm not sure if there's any differences people tend to find there. I let Katrina answer that in a minute because she did mid-year honours. But um, normally, yes, you're right, the main year court is larger than the mid-year. So usually we have 25 or so starting early in the year and then maybe 10 in mid-year. Last year for COVID reasons was very different and the courts were pretty similar. I think the mid-year court was even a bit bigger. Otherwise we run nearly every event, every um, course twice. So once for the main year, once for the mid-year court to give as much as possible, a similar experience. And with that, maybe Katrina wants to add something. Yeah, so I did mid-year because I also finished my degree in the middle of the year. And it was a little bit unusual because, because of COVID, there were a lot of deferrals. So our cohort actually ended up being quite large. But what I've heard from previous years is that it's generally a slightly smaller cohort, but it's still very much the same experience. Like all of the... Um, events and information sessions are structured to be a certain number of weeks after you start. Um, so not much really changes and your two weeks of leave will be over the Christmas shutdown. So I guess it's almost not like better, but it means that you take your time off when everybody else at the school takes time off because a lot of people kind of work through the middle of the year typically. I mean, cohorts do tend to have a certain sort of um, camaraderie between them and so on, because there are shared social events. So I guess you have a bigger cohort at the start of the year, but I think even, you know, even the smaller mid-year cohort, they all get along and talk to each other. So I don't, I don't think it's a massively different experience. I agree. And even if you know your mid-year student, you, of course, probably will only sign up sometime next year, but there's no harm in even contacting now, 
potential supervisors. Um, some supervisors really appreciate the advanced warning because especially for some mouse-based project, breeding up a colony of mice may take quite a bit of time. So if they know with a lot of pre-warning that there is a student coming, it may allow some project that would not be possible otherwise. So there's really no harm in doing it now, but it equally is easily possible to do that early next year and um, equivalent to what uh, someone would do in contacting the supervisor now for a start early next year. I got another question if um, JCSMR offers takes under, undergraduate students for course research projects, for example, BIOL 3208. Um, yes, in principle, um, yes. Again, you have to find a supervisor and contact them and organize it with them. That is, of course, independent of me as the honors convener, that is independent of people here. That is more dependent than on the um, course convener for that course and the individual supervisor. One thing that is important, if you do that, it, you cannot really continue on the same project for honors. It is very important if you do a research project beforehand, you cannot use any of the data that you've generated there for an honors project. It's just, it would be really unfair in terms of work that is achievable or not if you've worked already, let's say for three months as an undergraduate student on that same project. But many students like taking um, taking those undergraduate, that bio, was it 3208 students to, to um, you know, to get to know a student yes. and that sort of thing. And, uh, yes, it's a great opportunity to suss out potential supervisors and for them to meet you and um, see if they get along with you because of course it always goes both ways. Any other questions? Anyone has something? If not, I would say we close the session. Good luck with finding supervisors, exciting honors projects. Please um, get excited about science. And um, if you have any questions, contact me, Linda, or any of the um, departmental um, representatives for very specific questions. And we will try to either answer the question by ourselves or forward you um, to someone who can help you. And um, good luck. And Stay safe with COVID. Hopefully it all gets better from here. Thank you. And a special Thank thanks to all our um, presenters, including um, Katrina as a previous honors um, student sharing her experience and Carlo and Linda for organizing today's event. Thank you.